All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Game Engine API Design. Uh, just for a quick feel of the room, how many of you are currently or have ever worked in the games industry? Okay, so just a few of you, cool. Uh, so the way that this talk ended up, uh, it's about Game Engine API Design, but in order to actually get into that API design, you have to sort of understand the architecture behind the game engines first in order for them to make sense. And so there's kind of two parts to this talk. The first part being an overview of some of the common game engine architectures that are popular in the industry. And then the second half will be going more into the APIs themselves and what we can learn from them, that sort of stuff. So uh, I'm Alan Deutsch, and I'll be your presenter today. Uh, before we get started, I just have a quick disclaimer. Um, so I'm employed by Microsoft, and I work under their gaming division. And so uh, in that group, I'm in the advanced technology group, and so we do a lot of work with uh, the major game developers and other partners and create educational content. Um, this is educational content about games, but it's completely separate from work. And so any of the views or opinions or ideas expressed in this talk are mine alone and don't represent Microsoft or their gaming organization or anything. So if you're going to be mad at someone, be mad at me. Um, I like my job. Please don't make me lose it. <laughs> All right. So um, my road to C++ now is sort of an interesting story. And I'm really honored to be invited here as a speaker at such a prestigious conference. Um, I'm sure there's are an awful lot of conferences here in Aspen. And this is my favorite one. And hopefully, it's some of your favorites as well. And by the end of this talk, that won't have changed. So uh, for me, it all started out on my first console, which was the Game Boy Color. And so this thing uh, was pretty simple. Um, but back at the day when I had it, it was um, really exciting to me. It had this little gap in the back that you could put cartridges in. And these little tiny plastic cartridges contained whole worlds uh, that you could only really imagine otherwise. And that little screen there was just a window into these other worlds. Um, it wasn't all perfect, though. It had this little indicator light here. And uh, that thing, it was red. And as the battery started to die, it would dim, along with my hopes of you know, getting to a save point before the battery died. <laughs> um, so that was uh, by far my least favorite part of this device. But uh, for me, it all started in this game, Pokemon Red. That was my first video game. And uh, I really loved it because it was this whole new world to explore with all sorts of fantastic creatures. And you could train and grow as an individual and everything. And I became fascinated with how you can go from you know, some concept in your imagination to this real tangible world that people can go live in and experience. And so growing up, I always had in the back of my mind, how can something like that be done? How can it be made? How can I create these worlds? And uh, for me, that grew beyond just like, how can I make it into how can I learn about and create tools for other people to be able to do it as well. And so my first experience with a game engine was Unreal Engine. And uh, it was also sort of my first real job, because uh, there was this summer tech, uh, summer tech camp that I worked at. It was called ID Tech. I did that right after I had finished high school. And one of the classes that I got to teach there was an introduction to Unreal Engine. Uh, and so that was sort of my first experience with uh, helping other people be able to take their ideas and turn them into some tangible world. And that was really exciting for me. Uh, so after that, I started my undergrad at DigiPen Institute of Technology. It's this small little game development school in Redmond um, focused on games. And so I was in the CS program. And what's really interesting about DigiPen, especially for me, was that uh, every year you form a team with other students of various disciplines. So you'll have programmers, artists, sound designers, game designers, all these different fields. And you all work together to build a game. And you know, that was this thing that I had been so interested in growing up that it made a lot of sense to me to have some practical project where every year I get to take all the things I'm learning and put them together and make something awesome with them. Um, so that was great for me. And uh, I found myself in the niche of game engines. And so every year on my teams, I would build the sort of core technologies that the rest of the team would use to actually build something. And uh, as an engine developer, you get to experience all sorts of interesting programming problems because you want to make it really easy for everyone to use, be they a developer or some other non-technical sort of person. 
And so uh, as a result of that, I got pretty deep into C++ and architecture as well. And I met some really great people here. Um, there was this club called the Game Engine Architecture Club. And uh, one of the old leaders of it, Sean Middleditch, who some of you may have know, he's involved with the Standards Committee a bit, co-chair of SG14. So one year I was at GDC with him, and uh, he invited me to come to this SG14 meeting. So that was my first experience with the committee, going from undergrad straight to like the very best C++ programmers in the world, which was quite a jump for me. And uh, by the end of it, I had some idea of what some of the people had said here and there, but uh, most of it had gone over my head at the time. But uh, he sort of jokingly asked me um, what my proposal was. And so uh, we talked about it for a bit, and there's this data structure called slot map that's pretty popular in games and as it turns out is pretty popular uh, as a concept in other industries as well. And so I ended up writing a proposal for that, which I've been working on. And uh, through that proposal and sort of my other involvement in C++, I ended up here at CPP, uh, CPP now last year, and I presented a lightning talk on the slot map data structure. Um, so that was my sort of first real public speaking engagement, as it were. Um, here at this conference, and so that's a big part of why C++ now has a special place in my heart. And so I've, I've sort of dove down that C++ rabbit hole and gone pretty deep and learned a few things, and hopefully I can frame them in the context of game engines and architecture and API design, and you'll be able to get something useful out of it. So what exactly is a game engine? Um, I'm sure you've probably heard of them before, but you may not really know what they are. Um, it's a common question I hear from people outside the industry as well, such as my parents and friends who didn't go to DigiPen. Um, so if you think of it as sort of like the engine to a car, that's actually not far off. Because in a car, the engine is what's sort of powering it and helping it move forward. And in a game or a simulation, the engine is somewhat doing the same thing. It's the uh, bits and pieces inside that make everything work and help it move forward and progress through the different steps of a simulation. And uh, in computing, simulations have discrete steps. Um, so you calculate, say, a 60th of a second at a time uh, in fixed intervals or possibly dynamic, depending on the game. But uh, in more practical terms, a game engine is a platform. And so rather than targeting Windows or Linux or Android or iOS, a developer will target the game engine as their platform, and then um, the engine is able to provide something like platform abstractions. Uh, so you build your game for this game engine or using the game engine, and then it'll give you the option to export to all of your different target platforms that you're interested in. And so this makes it a lot easier for you as a developer to focus on just building your application, and then all of the platform dependent code is abstracted away behind engine interfaces, and you don't have to know about them. They'll just work for you, and it's someone else's problem to solve, which is really convenient. Um, but a game engine is about more than just platform abstraction. Uh, it's also important for content creation and collaboration. Uh, so you have all of these different disciplines working on a game, the sound people, artists, programmers, designers, and somehow they all have to work together to create one cohesive project. So while all of your developers are writing code for this engine, um, artists need to be able to import their assets, and so do the sound designers, and then some gameplay developers and level designers need to be able to place those things and actually build the world. And so a game engine provides all of the tools for that, like resource loading and processing and lots of optimizations so that they can all work together, and then gives you a nice user interface that someone who's not technical, like a level designer, might be able to use to actually put all of these different separate pieces together and build something cohesive. So some of the common technical functionalities inside of a game engine are things like artificial intelligence, uh, physics, and graphics. So those are things that are generally pretty common across all games, and they might provide them in different ways or to different extents, but in general, they're going to be offering some sort of common functionality so that you don't have to build everything yourself. Um, so for AI, for example, it might have uh, a framework for implementing your own behaviors, whereas physics is 
relatively the same across all different games um, with some exceptions. And so a physics engine might be able to work uh, the same for all sorts of different titles without much need for customization. So the scope of this talk um, needs to be narrowed down because there's an awful lot that game engines are able to do. But there's one core piece of functionality that's really crucial for any of them to be successful. And what that is, is the ability for developers to implement new behaviors. So if you go to a game engine and it doesn't have some feature that you need out of the box, you need a way to create that yourself. And so that's the area of game engines that I really want to focus on for this talk. So um, there's a lot of different terminology throughout the games industry, and you know, different engines will use different terms to represent the same thing. Uh, so I want to go over sort of the terminology that I'll be using so that you understand conceptually what it is uh, in the context of games. So the first term is game logic. Uh, that's basically just the logic that powers your game. So in something like chess, it would be the rules for how a piece is able to move, um, the turns, maybe a time limit for each player, and uh, logic such as that when you move a piece onto an opponent's piece, that piece has been captured. So that's sort of game logic. If you're not from the games background, it's kind of like business logic. But in the games industry, we don't really think of what we do as business. Um, so we call it game logic instead of business logic. The next one is entity. Uh, so the dictionary definition of an entity is a thing with a distinct and independent existence which is pretty much spot on for what we use it for in the games industry. Um, it, an entity is any distinct thing. Uh, so as long as you have something in your game that can be represented, it's probably an entity. So that could be a tree, an enemy, the player, maybe a rock somewhere. And uh, this definition is pretty much spot on with what you'd expect. Um, the independent part is a little bit iffy. Uh, in a game, you might have dependencies such as like a parent-child relationship. And so the position in the world of something might be dependent on where its parent is. But for the most part, this would be what you expect. We also have components. And so components are the small little bits that add functionality to an entity. Uh, so you might have, say, uh, a component with the transform data, which would be its position in the world, its orientation, which is like where it's facing or how it's rotated, and the scale of the object. Uh, so typically, these components will be attached to an entity to add either data or behavior. But depending on the engine, they can be used for other things as well. Some use them as just like an empty struct that's a tag specifying some characteristic of the entity that doesn't necessarily need any <coughs> data or logic associated with it. Um, some engines use them just as data. Some have behavior there as well. So there's a lot of variety across the industry for these. Um, systems are another one. Uh, so system is a pretty broad term. But in the context of game engine architecture, typically a system would be something that performs transformations on data. So uh, they're not necessarily in all game engines. And some of them put game logic elsewhere. But the ones that do use systems tend to use them for the game logic. And so a system will have some sort of dependencies for what data it needs in order to operate. And then those dependencies will be provided to it by the engine. And it's able to perform its data transformations to help do its part in advancing the simulation. Uh, there's also a couple different terms for types of games in the industry. So uh, the sort of most well-known games that you've probably heard of, uh, things like Halo or Overwatch, are called AAA titles. And so AAA basically just means it has a big budget. Um, the cost of developing the game and the cost of marketing the game are probably in the same ballpark. Um, these titles are generally backed by a major publisher like EA or Ubisoft. Um, and so they have a lot of resources available to them. And those publishers are able to do all sorts of things for them, like market research that smaller studios might not be able to do. Then on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, we have indie games. And so indie games, uh, or indie in general, is short for independent developer. And so uh, in the purest sense, it's a game developed by the developers with no publisher that has sort of their own opinions being brought onto it. There's no you know, 
open publicly traded company that has shareholders to satisfy. And so there's a lot more freedom to build what they want, but they don't have the same budget to make these grandiose games with uh, you know, lots of different functionality. And so they tend to be smaller, uh, much smaller development teams or even an individual person. And then uh, rather than trying to have like the greatest graphics and the best physics and really pushing the limits of the hardware, these games uh, are generally a bit simpler and focus on some unique or innovative mechanic that the developer really wants to portray or maybe a story that they want to tell. So those are the major differences between the two types of games. And there's a whole spectrum between those two. And there are even other types of games, such as uh, gambling or casino games, uh, which I won't really be covering. Um, I'm not super familiar with that part of the industry, but it is a major part of it. Um, they have very different constraints than the rest of us, though, in many ways. Um, so now that we've got the terminology out of the way, let's talk about game engine architecture. So there's many different ways to architect a game engine. And now that we know about all of these different parts that go into them, that those game engines are composed of, uh, we can take a bird's eye view of some of the common architectures that are more well known and how they compose, or how they, excuse me, are composed of the different basic parts. So the first one we're gonna go over is the inheritance hierarchy. Uh, this is fairly similar to in other domains. You start with some sort of base class uh, in a game, it would be your entity. And then as you have you know, different types of entities, you just inherit from that. Um, so this base might have things like move, update, animate, render, those sorts of functionality. And then those would be virtual calls that the derived types can implement based on the entity that it is. So if we have, say, a goblin and a wizard, maybe the goblin moves by walking around and it has different animations than a wizard whose animations might involve casting spells and it moves by teleporting. Um, their logic could be different as well with a boy or a, a goblin acting as perhaps part of a flock or swarm and having some simple boyd logic, whereas a wizard might have a bunch of spells that it chooses from and casts. Um, so then if you have some more derived type like an evil wizard, you get to reuse a lot of the functionality from your wizard and just maybe change which spells it has or how it makes its decisions on what to cast. Um, so that's fairly straightforward. But sometimes it doesn't work out so cleanly. And we have things like a goblin wizard. And so if you're familiar with inheritance, you'll know this is the dreaded diamond pattern. And so there are ways to work around this in uh, C++ with virtual inheritance. But it does leave other problems. Um, all those base class functions are now ambiguous. So if you know explicitly on your goblin wizard that you want to use the wizard's update, and not the goblins, then you can do that explicitly. But if that's not the case and you need to modify it a bit, there's no real way to customize that functionality. Um, you'll have to rewrite it for your goblin wizard. And so re-implementing all of this functionality sort of does away with the advantages of using inheritance and virtual calls for code reuse. Um, so maybe you do it a different way and you have a goblin wizard that derives from goblin and a human wizard that derives from human and now you have separate paths to it and you're able to get by. But now, while this would work for that situation, imagine later on you want to add some other races like dwarves or elves. And now you have to go through and implement wizard again in all of those different classes. And say you want to update the behavior of a wizard um, or fix a bug. Now, instead of just having to do it in one place, you have to do it once for every different type of character that could be a wizard. And then, you know, some of those races maybe even have sub-races, like a blood elf and a dark elf. So overall, this solution isn't great, and it leaves a lot to be desired. So in the games industry, we've looked at some other options for how to fix this. One of those is with the entity component architecture. In this approach, you have your entity type and you have component types. And so the entity is just some sort of connective tissue that these different components can hook into to work together. Um, so a component could have a base uh, functional, a base class, or it could not. Um, having a base does have some advantages. You can provide you know, some nice uh, helper functionality to any of the derived components for accessing each other or working with the entity. 
Um, so some examples of components you might have are a model, which tells you, you know, what the physical characteristics of your entity are, how it looks, and has the information for how it can be rendered. You might also have a collider, so that's the information needed for detecting collisions um, in physics. And so um, by doing this, you can implement that functionality once, and then you just change which model it is depending on the character. And so then you implement this logic once, and you can attach it to as many entities in whatever combinations as you want. So you get a lot better code reuse here. And then if you want to change something, you change it in one place, and it happens to everything that needs that behavior. So this is pretty great. Um, there are some issues, though, like there's dependencies here. In order to render a model, you need to know where it is so that you can render it in the correct place. And in order to detect collisions, you also need to know where it is so that you can detect those collisions in the correct place. It wouldn't be any fun if you have some monster 20 feet in front of you swinging his ax, and it still registers as a hit on you. Because even though visually he's in one place, the physical location, as far as your physics engine is concerned, is very different. Um, so that's not a very good user experience. So what we'll actually do is pull out some of that shared data into what's called a transform component that I mentioned earlier with the position and orientation information. And uh, so those components, instead of holding their own copy of the position in the model and in the collider, they'll get it from the transform. So this actually establishes a sort of soft dependency because uh, the model and collider don't necessarily have to have the transform, but they don't really work correctly without it. So they need that data, and they need a way to access it. And then all of these different components can be attached to your entity. So you can end up with something like this, where you have a model, a collider, and a transform that are all attached to your entity. And then the model and the collider can go through your entity to get the data they need from the transform. Uh, so going back to our example with the gameplay, and you have your humans and wizards and goblins and all that, um, this becomes a lot easier, right? If you want to make something a human, you have a human component, and you attach it, and you're done. Now it's a human. And uh, that's pretty straightforward. Now you can just make anything you want a human. And um, it may not have dependencies on a specific model or other data. Um, so it's fairly isolated. And then you can do the same thing with a wizard. And so now you have your human and your wizard components. And you can make all of your changes to your wizard functionality in one place. And even if, it, if it's a human or maybe you make it a goblin, either way, uh, they're using the same wizard functionality. And so as many races as you add, uh, it scales linearly. Um, instead of having to implement it multiple times and make changes in a bunch of places. So you end up with a lot cleaner code this way. Um, so adding new races also becomes simpler. You just implement the component for that particular race, and then instead of adding goblin or human, you add that one and any of these different classes that you've made for your character, like a wizard or you know, a smith or whatever, uh, they can all just be added to it um, one at a time, and there's no extra effort needed if you want to add more. So that's pretty nice. Um, the complexity scaling in this way goes from a sort of exponential increase every time you want to add functionality to a much easier linear increase. Um, adding one thing just makes it one thing more complicated. Um, so this is pretty great overall. Uh, the complexity is well managed. Logic is nicely contained. And uh, the component can have data and behavior together so that uh, most of that is self-contained. And then some of that shared data can be pulled out into separate components like the transform. Uh, so that's pretty good. But there are still some tight couplings. Um, your logic is tied to that data. And there's not necessarily a great way to express that. And so in practice, in your code, you might have some component logic somewhere that needs to go through the entity to get another component. And now all of a sudden, you've got a lot of pointer chasing going on. And uh, games have a lot going on in them. There's a lot of throughput that needs to happen. And it all has to happen uh, very consistently in time. Because you, if you have 60 frames rendered in your second, uh, that's great. But if 59 of them happen in the last 16 milliseconds, and one of them takes the entire rest of your second to render. It provides a really jarring user experience. And so we care not just about throughput, but also latency and having those frames be consistently timed. And one of the issues with having all of this pointer chasing is that it's performance cost that's very 
low, but it happens everywhere in your code base. So if you have your pointer chasing in uh, all of your code, there's not some specific place you can find with a profiler in your hot path that's really slow and needs to be optimized and gives you a big win to help you get your performance goals. Uh, you have to optimize basically the entire way your engine and all of your gameplay logic works. And that's not very easy to do. So looking at our architecture, there's not really a good way to avoid this. Uh, so we might have to look at another option if we need to optimize this. And that's more of a problem for the AAA industry than indies. Uh, typically, an indie studio isn't going to run into the same level of performance issues because their games are just smaller in scope. They're not going to have the same hundreds of thousands of objects on screen at a time or in a level. Um, there's a lot less going on. And so it's a bit easier to manage. But in AAA, you need something else. And so there was a great uh, keynote at CPP Con in, I believe, 2014 by Mike Acton. And so this talk was really well received. It was called Data Oriented Design in C++. And uh, this guy came from uh, a game studio that used C++ very much as though it were C with classes. And uh, that's basically what he was advocating for in this talk, along with basically uh, organizing your logic so that you just iterate over arrays of data and perform transformations, which has great cache coherency and leads to a lot less pointer chasing, the CPU prefetcher is able to do its job, and everything runs a lot faster. And this talk was really well received, not just by the games industry, but I think by the C++ audience in general. Uh, if you go to the CppCon YouTube channel and sort by views, it's actually number two, and it's only behind the next talk by about 1%. So it's uh, one of the most popular C++ talks of all time. And uh, it's very exciting. And it's surprising that someone was able to come to a C++ conference and basically say, yeah, we don't really use any of the fancy C++ functionality. We just use C with classes, and that works for us, and it's fantastic. And the talk was well received, which is great. So um, there is a game engine architecture that uses data-oriented design. So um, looking at our sort of entity component architecture, um, we see a lot of issues with this pointer chasing. And we can mitigate that a bit by putting these components into arrays. Right? So if we put all of the components of a particular type in an array together, um, we're able to get a lot better performance. And we can update these components one, at a, one type at a time. So you know, update all of the models, update all the colliders. Probably not in that order, though, because you'd want to handle collisions before you render things. But it gives you a bit better cache coherency. And that's something that can be done transparently in that architecture without really needing to change any of your user code. So that'll help a lot in removing some of those cache misses that lead to round trips out to memory. But there are still some issues. Um, we have all of those dependencies between components. So your model and your collider need to access the transform. And uh, for a particular entity, those may not be in the same order. So while trying to update your model, you could be jumping all over memory going to your entity just to find your transform data. And if you have a parent whose position changes where yours is in the world, then you have to go to that parent as well, and it becomes a lot more complicated. And so even though we have some nice um, segmented data that works together, like the collider and the transform, uh, and we're able to iterate over them, they might not both be index aligned in memory. So while one of them would be cache coherent, the other would still be causing jumps in memory. So you get a good bit of performance this way, but you don't get everything you need. And so that works here with the colliders. It also works with the model and transform. But that has the downside of still having all of those cache misses. So the next architecture is the entity component system. And what it does is it sort of takes these structures and it makes those dependencies more explicit and it gives you the opportunity to index align all of your different types of components for a particular object so that as you're iterating over a set of them you can see all right here's object one here's object two here's object three and instead of needing a specific entity type you can just use an index into the arrays and so the way an entity component system works is uh, rather than having all of these different components contain the logic that logic gets moved out into systems, and the components will typically just contain data. And so a rendering system might need the transform and model components, while the collision system needs transform and collider. And then other systems can have other dependencies, 
and all of these dependencies need to be more explicitly laid out so you can sort of see at a glance um, what logic needs what data. And that gives you a lot more opportunities for optimizing as well as for managing your complexity. So that's sort of the overview of our different architectures for game engines that we're going to look at. So let's take a look at some actual real-world production game engines that are actually used to ship games today. Uh, the first of which is Unity. So Unity is a really wildly popular game engine. And uh, the previously mentioned Mike Acton works there now. And he's working on some new stuff that isn't really finalized yet. So we're not going to go into it in this talk. But uh, they're working on building an entity component system. Uh, since that's not really done yet, we're not going to spend any time going into the APIs. But it is something that will be potentially a topic for future talks. But uh, Unity is quite possibly the most popular game engine on the market today. Um, it's incredibly popular, especially for things like mobile and VR. And uh, most indie games today, I would say, are using Unity. And I think the majority of you know, like the top 1,000 free mobile games are built in Unity as well. And so Unity doesn't actually use C++ for their APIs. They use a C Sharp scripting API. But behind the scenes, the engine is actually built in C++. And so they just expose the C Sharp API in order to gain some of the functionality there and make it a bit more approachable for their users. And that's something Unity has done really fantastically well. Um, it's so easy to learn and pick up Unity that now a lot of online courses on programming will start with game development using Unity. And it's a really great tool for learning programming because unlike you know, making a little command line app or Hello World where you get some output like Hello World printed on your screen, which isn't very exciting, uh, when you're learning game development in a game engine, um, your Hello World is like a tree or a character that you can press buttons and it'll walk around. And so it's a lot more exciting. And as someone who's learning programming for the first time, uh, you get a lot more interesting feedback and positive feedback loops that help you keep going and wanting to continue learning. Um, so let's explore some of their C-sharp APIs and how they make it easy for users to learn programming and learn the engine and make games. Uh, so this first one here is a simple component. And so this has just sort of the um, basic pieces that you need for a component in Unity. Um, so these are functions that you can use, like start and update. And putting them on your class, the engine will know what they are and be able to call them automatically. Um, so this is basically what you would get, something like this, if you were to create a new component through Unity's uh, editor, which is their sort of GUI front end. Um, and so this snippet is incredibly simple, but there's some interesting things we can observe here. Um, the first is that Unity components inherit from a class called Mono Behavior. And so that's uh, the sort of component base class that I mentioned earlier. It provides easy to use functionality for things like accessing the entity that it's attached to and getting the data from the transform or other components that you may need. Um, so this works very similarly to how inheritance works in C++, if you're not familiar with C Sharp. Um, the main difference is instead of specifying the access here, uh, it's just whatever the base class has or the mono behavior, that's the access that will be available to your component. So it also has these methods, uh, start and update. And so uh, you may note that they're not virtual and there's no override keyword there. And uh, in C Sharp, in order to override a virtual keyword or a, a virtual method, you need to use the override keyword, which isn't present here. So they've actually got uh, what we could call magic methods. And these methods are ones that are specifically known by the engine and they're documented as functions you can add to your component. And if they're present, the engine will automatically call them for you at the appropriate time. So that's very similar to how a virtual method works. But as C++ programmers, I'm sure you all know that there's some overhead associated with a virtual function call. And so by using these magic methods and having a way of detecting that they're there, it's possible to get better performance because you don't have those same virtual dispatches happening. Um, so in Unity, this functionality is implemented using reflection. So C Sharp has reflection as a language level feature. And we don't have that yet in C++, but hopefully in the future we will. 
Um, but these are specifically named functions, so there are ways to find them. Um, so first, they have a fixed signature. So we know that any time there's like a start function or an update function, it'll be of the form void with a specific name and then no arguments. And so instead of needing to search for any function on a class, we actually just have to be able to find these specific ones. And so that is a, a problem, but it's something that we can solve in reflection uh, with tools like Sphene. Um, and if you were here at C++ now last year, the odds are good you might actually know an even better solution. Um, there was a talk presented by Marshall Clow that has an even better way of doing this. And so that talk was on the detection idiom, or as he calls it, a better way to Sphene. Um, so this is really great because it basically gives you a way of saying, hey, I want to know if this code would compile for a given type T. And so you can basically say, you know, for this T, which would be whatever the user's component is, if I were to call update on it, would that code compile? And so the detection idiom seeks to answer that question for you in a way that will compile and give you a true or false answer, regardless of whether the code you're asking about would actually compile itself. Um, so let's take a look at what code for that might look like. So there's basically three parts that we have for detecting an update function. So let's take a look at each of them one at a time. Uh, the first one is uh, the detection meta function. So this is where the code that you want to test out and see if it would compile will live. Um, so there's a few parts to it. The first is sort of this boilerplate where we declare our uh, alias template. And so that should be fairly straightforward to the audience here. So I won't go into that too much. The next part is our meta function itself. And so we use decl type because that gives us an unevaluated context so that our code may be able to uh, exist here even though it wouldn't compile uh, in, uh, in an evaluated context and we're still able to test against it. Um, so within this decl type unevaluated context, there are also a couple parts to pay attention to. The first is std decl val. And so what std decl val does is whatever type you give it, It'll add an R value reference and then return, or at least its signature will say that it's going to return that R value qualified type. So for us, passing in our T reference, um, the collapsing semantics for references will give us the T reference that we put in. And so this function isn't actually defined anywhere. There's no body to it that actually exists. So if you were to put this in an actual evaluated context, it would fail to compile. But since we have it living inside of an unevaluated context, we're able to do this and get something that resolves as a reference to a T that we can then try to call methods on to detect if they're available. So the next part is the function that we want to detect. So that's our update function. And since we have something that resolves as a T reference, we can try to call update on it in this unevaluated context. And that's basically the, the gist of what we're trying to figure out here is if this particular code would compile for a given T. Um, so with that, we have all we need for our meta function, and we can dive into actually using the detection idiom. So it's pretty straightforward here. Um, you basically define a type trait with it. Um, so ours is called has update. Again, we have our boilerplate template alias, and uh, that's not too interesting. Then here we have our call to is detected. And so this functionality is actually currently proposed in the library fundamentals TS. So there's a good chance that in the next you know, two to five years, we'll actually have this in the standard library and be able to use it. Uh, but the code is freely available online. You can search Google for the detection idiom, and I'm sure you'll be able to find a working implementation somewhere. Um, but the way it works is really straightforward. You basically just say is detected, and then you pass in your meta function as the first argument, and t as the second argument for the type you want to test against that meta function. And so the type that's returned to you will have some static public member named value that either resolves as true or false, depending on whether your code would compile in that meta function for the provided t. And there's even fancier stuff you can do with this. Um, we don't really need it for this talk, so I won't get into it. But if you're interested, I definitely recommend checking out Marshall's talk, which gives you the whole hour of depth on this particular approach. So then finally, we're programmers and we're really lazy. So we want to get a variable template for this so that we can just use has update v for our t. And uh, our autocomplete will give us a bit more mileage and it's easier to use. 
Um, so that's just a sort of nice to have feature. Another thing of note here though, is that uh, this is actually const expert. So uh, we're able to detect this information at compile time, and then we can use compile time branching for things like if const expert or uh, selecting overloads using Sphene to branch what happens in our logic. And so all of that overhead gets moved to compile time, and then at runtime we have no extra overhead. So just like Unity's C Sharp approach, we're able to provide these ma magic methods and have no runtime overhead associated with them. Um, so there's a few of these that we want, and in Unity there's nearly 70 of these special named functions that you can use. And that's a lot to implement, so we can use a little macro that generates all of our boilerplate for us, and then you just pass in the name of the function you want to detect, and it'll find it for you. And if you want to get really fancy, you could build one of these that takes different numbers of arguments as well, with particular types as the parameters, but we don't really need that for this example. So I'll leave that as an exercise to you, the viewer. Um, so what we can't do yet, uh, there are some things that C Sharp gives Unity in reflection that allow C Sharp and Unity to implement much nicer features than some of the things we can do in C++. One of the big examples of this is uh, messaging. So here we have an example of a component that broadcasts a message. And so you can see that logic happening here. And where you see game object, just think entity. Uh, game object is Unity's name for an entity. Um, but they're effectively the exact same thing. And so here you can broadcast a message on a game object. I, I can't, I can't uh, so the way that this works is uh, they pass in a string name for the function that they want. Uh, so you can see here we have apply damage. And then uh, apply damage is also a function. And so we don't have a way to go from a string name in C++ to a function. And additionally, uh, this doesn't just work on your class. Uh, it'll actually go to your entity that the component is attached to, and it'll call that function on any other components that have it on the entity as well. And it doesn't stop there. It'll also do it for any children that are uh, parented to your entity. So that gives them a lot of flexibility, and they have this really nice event system that doesn't really require any advanced understanding of how events work. And you can pass parameters to it, which will go to any of those functions. And if the function doesn't happen to take that parameter, it just gets ignored. And they have additional traits you can use as well. And so this is really neat because it lets you basically implement your events whatever way you want. And so while we can detect a specific function if we know it at compile time, uh, they use strings as a runtime value which means they could actually wire up events uh, at runtime in like some other scripting language or through a GUI editor, and they don't need to know that information at compile time. And since those functions could have any name, um, we can't really use the detection idiom to detect them because we don't know their name at compile time. So this is something that might be available to us in the future in C++ once reflection is standardized or if reflection is standardized. But today, we don't have a way of implementing this very cleanly. So another thing that they are able to get out of reflection is a sort of GUI front end that's generated automatically. So you as a user can implement some sort of component. Um, in this one, we have it called level script. And you can put whatever public members you want. And since Unity has reflection, it can just go over your class and detect what all of those public members are and what their types are and just expose them in a GUI automatically. And the user doesn't have to write any additional code to make this happen. Um, so this is really helpful because if you have some non-technical person like a designer, uh, they can just go in and click on an entity and modify values on its components. And you never had to write any reflection code. You never had to write any GUI code. It's all automatically generated. And so this makes it a lot easier to collaborate with people, and there's a lot less overhead for the programmer in order to support that. So the same is true of other features as well. Um, for example, in a game, it's really common to want to serialize data. So that's taking your you know, programming language representation of it and converting it into some other format, like JSON or a binary representation. And that's useful because games often need to save their state, or load levels, or send information over a network. 
And so having reflection makes it possible to generate all of that automatically instead of having to do it for all of your types by hand. Um, so that's quite useful. And then it also makes it easier to deserialize, which is taking that separate representation of your types and then converting them back into the representation in your programming language. Um, so this is functionality that's really important in games. And the engines that are built in C++ have really horrible workarounds for it. Um, so one approach is building your own custom C++ parsing tool. Um, nowadays, that might be done using Quang. But uh, one of the other popular game engines called Unreal Engine that I mentioned earlier, uh, they've actually been doing this for a lot longer than Clang has been around. And so they have their own custom header tool. And uh, the way that people are able to use it is above a member. They're able to say, you know, U property for Unreal property. And then they have things like network synced um, so that it'll automatically be synchronized over a network and serializable and specifying the name of it in the editor. Um, there's other ways of doing it as well. Um, there's this game engine called Lumberyard made by Amazon. And the approach that they take is building out a really nice reflection library so you don't have to write all of these sorts of code by hand. But what you have to do is manually register all of your types in their reflection engine one member at a time, which is horrible. If you could just write your code and all of that reflection is generated for you, it's a much better experience for developers than having to explicitly implement your reflection for all of your types by hand. And it gets even worse because there's a lot of different contexts in which your data might be reflected. And so you may end up having to implement that reflection code multiple times for the same type because you want one context for the editor and a different context for serializing. Um, so overall, it provides a pretty terrible experience. And so reflection is one of those features that game developers are really looking forward to in C++ because our other solutions are not nearly as good today. But it's possible to build tools that'll generate it all for you in Clang, but that's still a lot of work, and having it as a language feature would be really nice. So let's take a look at some of the other APIs that Unity has for interacting with components and entities. Um, so one of them is get component. And so here's an example that demonstrates that. So you have one component, and it needs to get another component. So ours is get component generic example here. Um, this is from the Unity documentation somewhere. And so just like before, we have to inherit from Mono behavior because we're implementing a component. Um, so that's fairly straightforward still. And then here we have this hinge joint type, which is some other kind of component. And so we specify it, and then we can get our component using a sort of generic interface, kind of like templates in C++. Um, so since we're accessing a component of one type from a component of another type, we're actually establishing a dependency here. And so uh, Unity has a way of making it a soft dependency. So all of these types in Unity and C Sharp are reference types. And so we can check if it's null. And uh, in this way, we're able to make it a soft dependency instead of a hard dependency. Uh, our function will still work if it's not there. And we just have some additional logic for if it is. Um, so this is a pretty nice way of handling the dependencies. And there are some issues that ar uh, arise if you don't have this sort of soft dependency thing. Um, for example, if you have a hard dependency, uh, you could check that it's there um, before allowing the user to attach a component. But then you could run into issues with deserializing, where if you're loading something from memory um, or another representation and a component with a dependency is loaded before the dependency itself, you run into issues. Or if you have two components that both depend on each other, um, then neither of them can be added until the other is there and you run into issues. And so having this sort of soft dependency as an option is great. But uh, there are issues with it. Um, for example, these dependencies are sort of declared wherever in the code. It could be in any of those nearly 70 different magic functions or even some other method on the class that is called by one of them. So it's not easy to figure out what your dependencies actually are. Um, so then here, again, we have our game object. And this game object is, again, our entity type um, in Unity. And so uh, one of the things here is that in order to get another component, you have to go through the game object. And so now we have a dependency not only on the component itself, but also the game engine. And in order to get to the component, 
we have to jump through memory um, from our component to the game object and then from the game object to that other component. So we're running into those same issues with cache misses. Um, so there are some other things that might be familiar to us. Uh, this snippet is taken from the documentation on uh, transform parenting in Unity, which is basically how you establish a parent-child relationship between entities. Um, so here is where we set the parent, right? We have a player.transform.parent and player is an entity instance. Um, and then we're able to set the parent there. And so uh, the way that parenting works, it's actually on the transform in Unity, not the entity itself, um, which sort of makes sense because the, the main reason for parenting is so that you have relative positions. Um, so in Unity, the transform is actually built into the entity type. So instead of having to jump through memory to go from your entity to your transform, uh, they're together in memory. So you at least save one cache miss there because nearly every entity in a game engine will have a transform. Um, anything in a game probably is somewhere. Uh, so there are not a lot of cases where you would need an entity and not a transform. So this design sort of makes sense and is able to buy them a little bit more performance. And then this parent member is a reference to another entity somewhere, in this case, the new parent that was passed into this function. Um, so here we have some code that uses that parent information. Um, so we have the player's transform parent, and then we want to print the name of it. And so this code is really easy to write, um, just like as a developer or someone who's new to programming. This logic isn't complicated. It's very simple. There's not a lot of syntactic overhead. And so this code is really easy to write. And as a result, it tends to exist all over in the code bases of games made in Unity. And uh, there is a downside to this, because while it's really easy, there's a lot of pointer chasing going on. And if you're not someone who knows a lot about low-level programming and hardware, um, this isn't going to look like code that's slow. There's nothing exciting going on here. It's just like you're getting the name of your parent, which is really straightforward. But uh, there's actually a few things happening here. Uh, first, we have to jump from this component to the player. Uh, so that's our first potential cache miss. And uh, there's some performance overhead there. And then um, that may not be stored contiguously, so not ideal. Then the next part is that we have to go from that player and its transform, which are, again, together in memory. So that's probably an L1 cache hit. The performance overhead isn't bad. But we have to go from there to the parent. And we don't really know where the parent could be. So in our worst case scenario, that's another cache miss. And then finally, we want to get our parent's name. And so that name would be most likely a string. And uh, I'm not sure the specific working implementation details of strings in Unity and C Sharp. But if we assume that it has a sort of small buffer optimization like we have in C++, that would make sense. But uh, in our worst case scenario, that name is longer than the small buffer optimization allows. And so it's another cache miss because it has to jump out to heap memory somewhere in order to get that string. So just for this simple code here, uh, we've had potentially three cache misses. And so if you have this code once, it's not a big deal. But if you have it in tight loops all over your game and all of your different components, the cost starts to add up really quickly. And a game could have 100,000 different entities in it. And each of those entities could have a dozen or more components. And if all of those components are being updated 60 times a second, you end up with a lot of cache misses going on every second. And all of a sudden, your performance starts to degrade. And there's no one place you can optimize to fix it because it's just everywhere. You know, death by a thousand paper cuts. So um, from here, we can <coughs> see that Unity has components and entities. So uh, it's pretty clearly the component entity architecture. And in a real production system, of course, you're probably not going to stick completely strictly to an architecture, and they have other things like their event system that don't necessarily fit perfectly in that model. But overall, Unity has done a really fantastic job at its goal. Um, the company mission is to democratize game development. And by making it so approachable and easy, they've done a really excellent job at that. And now there are millions of game developers that probably never would have been able to explore that as a potential career path or a hobby if it weren't for tools like Unity that make it a lot more accessible to them. Um, building a game engine yourself is a ton of work, and it requires a ton of domain knowledge. And so having something like Unity that provides a simple, easy-to-use tool for doing that has done a lot of uh, great things for the game industry. Um, so 
that's fantastic. But when it comes to the AAA industry, which is those games that are really trying to push the boundaries on graphics and uh, performance and really get the maximum amount of performance they can out of their hardware, uh, all of these cache misses in Unity uh, add up a bit too much. And they're really not able to use it because that's something that can't easily be optimized in that architecture. And since that code is hidden away as something that you as a developer don't have access to, you can't even do anything about it. So in the AAA industry, um, it may be surprising, but off-the-shelf solutions are not very commonly used. Um, Unreal is used a bit, but not super extensively. And in the past four years of the like top 30 by revenue or gross uh, income AAA titles, uh, only like three or four of them used an off-the-shelf game engine. All the rest of them use their own custom in-house engine, um, be it developed by that studio or possibly by the same publisher or some other studio within the publisher. So um, one of the really successful AAA titles in recent memory is a game called Overwatch. And so uh, before its release in May of 2016, the Overwatch open beta had nearly 10 million players. And that's just the beta, not even the final release. So the, the difference in scale for something like this versus a game made in Unity is huge. Uh, a typical Unity game um, might have as few as tens of downloads, where it's just the person who made it and some friends. Or it could go into millions or even tens of millions, but they wouldn't typically operate at the same scale. Um, a year and a half after this game came out, it had 35 million players, and that's still been climbing. And so in addition to being a wildly successful AAA title, um, they also push the boundaries on engine design a bit. And they've been using some of the uh, more recent architecture developments in the industry. And so if you're interested in that sort of thing, there's a talk uh, from the Game Developers Conference, or GDC. And they have an online vault of their talks. Uh, you have to pay for access. So if you're not in the games industry, it's probably not uh, worthwhile for you. But if you are, I definitely recommend the talk. Um, it's called Gameplay, Architecture, and Netcode. And it's presented by a guy named Timothy Ford, uh, who was on the Overwatch team. And so it has a lot of information about how the game engine was structured and uh, some of the lessons they learned and a lot of the tricks they used to have seamless networking code. Um, from the perspective of the user. Uh, so we can't really go into all of that, but I'd like to explore some of the design decisions they've made with their API. And so this slide right here, which is taken from that talk, uh, actually includes, I think, just about all of the C++ code that was in that presentation. And I know it's small and you probably can't read it. I have slides where it's blown up a bit bigger, so don't worry about reading it here. But uh, the engine is written in C++, and so this is all of what was shown in the talk. Um, so it's a lot to take in at once, so we'll break it down a bit. So the first is that they use component tuples. Um, so this one here is a physics tuple, and it has three different kinds of components on it. Um, so one of the advantages of this is that now these dependencies have been declared in advance, and it's known by the type system. Um, so you can see anything that uses a physics tuple has dependencies on those three types of components. Um, another thing to note is that it has pointers directly to them. So there's no sort of middleman entity class that you have to go through in order to get them, which takes one potential cache miss out of the equation. Um, another advantage of this approach is that by using pointers, they can change how their components are stored behind the scenes, and that's invisible to the user. Uh, you don't have to know what container they're in. You don't have to know where they are in memory. You don't know have, to have to know how they're laid out. And as long as these three components are all pointed at uh, components that are associated with the same entity conceptually, uh, it still does what you need it to. And uh, through this sort of interface, you don't have a way of accessing other components. So you can't just take on extra dependencies somewhere else in code where it's not easy to find. Um, all of these are laid out ahead of time. Um, so that's one of the big advantages of this approach. So they also use data-oriented design. So here's an example of some game logic that uses those tuples. Uh, they have a range-based for loop that loops over the result of some get physics tuples function. And they're able to get the components they need from that tuple. And so they have um, some container that gets returned by that function. We don't necessarily know what it is, and it doesn't actually matter. But uh, given that they want performance, it's pretty safe to assume that this is probably an array or some other array-like container. Um, so they're able to get good cache performance out of it. 
and uh, behind the scenes, whatever optimizations they're doing for the memory layout of the components is invisible to the user, but is still optimizable if it becomes an issue. Uh, they can still go in and change it, and it doesn't break all of their gameplay code everywhere. So that's a pretty great design as far as uh, adding surface area for optimization options. So while there's shockingly little code in this sample, there's actually a lot of information that we can use to figure out more about the architecture of the Overwatch engine. Um, so clearly it has components, and those component dependencies are explicitly specified, but you can't really tell what the architecture is from what's on screen currently. Um, if you were able to read that whole slide, you might know, but uh, the answer is actually that it has a physics system. So that's where this code snippet lives. It's in their physics system. So now we know that this game engine has some concept of components and it has some concept of systems. And a system's dependencies are expressed through those component tuples. But curiously, there's nothing that really appears to be an entity type. Um, it's actually been hiding in plain sight and those component tuples are the entity type. And so there's not a single entity type that everything goes through. They have specialized ones for each system depending on what its dependencies are. And so in this way, the uh, entity type doesn't actually need to exist. Um, so we have it here, the physics tuple, but there's different representations of it for different systems. And instead of giving you a generic interface that lets you do whatever you want, it has some constraints on it, which gives them more opportunities for optimization, and it gives the user less opportunities to do things that are expensive um, and will add up to high performance cost and you know, a death by a thousand paper cuts sort of approach. So with the sort of triple play of these entities, components, and systems, uh, we can determine that this is almost certainly an entity component system architecture. And uh, in this particular case, you don't have to take my word for it because in the talk they've actually called it an ECS, and so we know for sure that that's what it is. But I still think it's an interesting exercise to look at the interfaces for a system and use that to determine how it's architected behind the scenes. And uh, it's been fascinating for me observing how the architecture of a system and the interface for it have influence on each other. And um, designing your system with a particular architecture sort of informs the interface. And building your interface in a certain way sort of informs how it gets architected behind the scenes. So. Um, it does get better, though. Uh, in addition to telling us that it's an ECS, uh, they also shared some insights about how it's used and some of the patterns for usage that emerged. Um, so one of the things that's uh, not really shown here, but uh, a lesson that's a takeaway, is uh, they have components that are only data, and then their systems are only logic. So there's no mixing of those two. And then any shared functionality goes off in utilities somewhere as like C-style functions. But uh, some systems do need state in some way, right? If you have a system that manages your window um, where the game is actually rendered to, it needs at the very least a native handle to that window. And if it has no state at all, there's no way to operate with that. So what they've done is they've uh, used within the model of an entity component system, uh, something that they call singleton components. And so that's a component that there's only one of at a time. Um, and what they'll do is they'll put the system state in those sort of singleton components. And so then there's some other advantages of this as well, because if there are other systems that need the same data, they now have a way of accessing that data without taking on a dependency to the other system. And so in this way, they're able to architect it in such a way that there are no dependencies between systems, and there's no systems that call functions on each other. Um, so that's great. Uh, another thing that's interesting is that Declaring these dependencies ahead of time has some adva uh, advantages. So on this slide from them, you can see a column of systems and a couple columns of components. Don't worry about reading them. It's not important. Uh, the only thing that matters here really for us is the stuff that's highlighted in blue in those columns. So there are six systems highlighted and something like 13 or so components. And uh, the reason that they're highlighted is because uh, those dependencies being declared ahead of time, they also have a way of expressing if a dependency is read-only. And so if you know whether something is going to be 
read access only or read and write, uh, you can actually make decisions about multi-threading based on that. Right? If you have two systems that only write to different data and any shared data is read only, uh, you can actually safely execute those in parallel. And so those six systems on the left and the 13 components on the right represent systems that can run in parallel and their dependencies. And so they have a bunch of slides on this showing all of the different ones that they have. And the takeaway is that through this approach, uh, not only do you add the ability to optimize things based on memory layout, but you can also improve performance by doing multi-threading. And uh, because you have contracts sort of at your API level with the user, you can do this multi-threading behind the scenes and do it in such a way that it's safe and it's invisible to the person implementing logic. And so all of a sudden you can have like game designers with a little bit of technical experience, but certainly no deep knowledge of multi-threading, write code that's safely multi-threaded. And so that gives you this whole additional vector for improving performance. Um, so another thing is that the way they access components is through this sort of function. Um, so there's a downside to this, right? Whenever you want to implement a new function or a, a new system, you have to write one of these. And you probably have to define your tuple type as well for the component tuples that you need. So that's not ideal. It means you have to write a lot of extra code that's boilerplate that really is the same everywhere with only slight differences being the different types of components you want. And so in the world of C++, we have variadic templates, which are really great at expressing this sort of concept, right? You have something and a variable number and types of types. Um, so we can actually express this sort of request as, you know, the way you can interpret this is the system wants all of the entities with a particular set of components. So if we were to implement that, we could do it something like this, right? You have a class called entities with, and then you have some template arguments. And then when the user is writing their code, they would say something like entities with, and then list out the types of components they want, which is both incredibly expressive because anyone reading the code can see it and immediately know what those dependencies are. And it also provides a generic interface. So you can implement this code one time and use it everywhere, and it'll work the same for everyone. And then if you need to optimize it, you do it in one place instead of everywhere. So how this works behind the scenes can vary. Um, all it really needs in order to fit that model that the Overwatch engine was using is a begin, a begin and end iterator. And then those iterators have to have some sort of type that gives them access to the components that they listed. So um, what this might be storing is potentially a std tuple, right? That's the sort of obvious equivalent to what they're doing in a generic context. Um, you can put whatever template arguments are on this entities with type into the tuples, have like a vector of them. That's easy. And if you want to change the container behind the scenes, you can do that. And it doesn't really affect the user code anywhere. But uh, tuples have a kind of terrible interface. And so if you have people who aren't necessarily advanced uh, C++ users and they're more used to like just really basic code, um, having to do like get zero and know that that's a particular component isn't really ideal. And reading the code, it's not very clearly expressed either. Um, so we could have some sort of intermediate representation or our own type, um, like uh, an entity that's been constrained based on which components you've specified here. So we could do that with something like a, a constrained entity type that's also a variadic template. And so it would store those in the container. And then through this constrained entity type, we could provide a, a much prettier interface for the user to use in order to access their components. Um, so another advantage here is that all of these component types, we can const qualify them. And that's how we specify that they're read only. And so now that read only versus read and write access is specified explicitly through the type system and there's no sort of extra functionality we need. So if we have that, we can also uh, provide an interface depending on whether something is const or not. Uh, so if we were to give some sort of get function for components, uh, we can choose which overload is available based on the const correctness. And then since those are different functions, um, in our implementation somewhere, we can check if the constness is matched with the way that they specified it in the uh, entities with container. And so by doing so, 
we can give them some nice, clean, easy to read error because we have all of the context available to us using like a static assert and say, hey, this is wrong. Here's why it's wrong. You need to change your constness or request this in your entities with. Um, so that gives us a way of really explicitly declaring our dependencies and then enforcing them at compile time as part of the type system and providing clear error messaging to the user. So now if a user wants to implement a system, say like some really simple physics stuff, it could look like this, right? They have a velocity system. It has an update function that takes the delta time for the frame. And then they again have a range based for with some sort of function called get entities with and they list out their correctly const qualified components. And then they get um, some sort of entity representation, which we're calling E here. Um, and they can get their components off that using the same familiar interface from Unity. And so uh, here we have really simple game logic, right? We have a position and we're just adding the velocity scaled by the time delta for this frame. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. And then we have all of the dependencies expressed explicitly with our get entities with function. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. And then getting the components, we have to have the correct constness here. So the const has to match in order for that to work. Um, so there's where we sort of get all of our components and accessing them uses a really similar interface to what they might be used to from working in Unity. Um, this code overall is fairly concise. There's not a lot of extra stuff going on here beyond what the programmer wants, but there is a decent amount of boilerplate. Um, we have our magic method as well, the update. And so adding a parameter to it, such as the delta time, is really easy. We just, uh, in our meta function, we would put in a float inside the call to update, and then it would still work uh, for this case. Uh, so this is a pretty good approach, but can we make it better? Um, if we take a, a look at sort of what's here, uh, we have all of this logic, which isn't necessarily the logic for our game, right? We have to declare this class, we have to make things public, uh, we have to loop over all of these entities with things, and then uh, from that we have to get our components off of that entity type, and then we have to have our closing braces and everything. So overall, only about half of this code is what actually does our game logic. Um, so there's a lot of extra boilerplate there that has to be implemented every time, and we may not actually need it. So what if we could write code without all of that, right? What are the things that we actually need? Um, we have a function, and uh, if we want our logic to have any sort of organization to it, we're gonna need functions to uh, make that a bit cleaner. And so it takes in the delta time for the frame, which is something we need in order to perform our game logic, so that still makes sense. Um, we also need our components, and we need to know their types and the correct constantness of them. So that's something we can't avoid either. But uh, this is something that could be potentially taken in as a parameter to the function. Uh, and then finally, we have the game logic itself. So this is what actually does the work, and obviously we can't get rid of that either. So if we were to make some system code that has our absolute minimum amount of code necessary so that the developer writes just what they need and nothing else, Maybe it could look like this, right? You have your update function, you take in the delta time, and then references to the components you want. And much like in the Overwatch engine, um, this makes it transparent to the user how that data gets there. They just get a reference to it, and behind the scenes, that could just be uh, stuff that's stored linearly in memory. Um, so all of the calls to this function would be very cache friendly. And it's a surprisingly small amount of code compared to what we had before. I mean, if we compare it, we have all of this versus just basically two lines of code and then a closing bracket. Um, so this is great. And it gives us a lot of opportunity to optimize as well. Um, if we do it in this approach, where the, the for loop over all of the entities happens within the type, there's nothing we can do to optimize that. But if we have it here, where it's just a function that does one step of it, uh, we could actually put calls to this function in something like a parallel for loop and then execute individual systems in parallel as well. Um, so it gives us a lot of opportunity to optimize our code even further if we need to, uh, which is an advantage here. Uh, we get a lot more possibility for multi-threading. And so these functions could have any sort of signature, right? We don't know what the components are ahead of time. A user could specify their own new types of components and all sorts of different functions that take them as parameters. So our approach to detecting from before probably wouldn't work as well um, because we're not really detecting a specific signature anymore. <coughs>
Um, in practice, we might want some extra data as well. Um, in this case, the float DT um, or possibly other state. And that could be moved out into components uh, as like a singleton approach like Overwatch, but maybe not. Um, so we have, you know, maybe our example is something like uh, a class where we have a function that does all of the data processing and some state. And we want to make sure that the user doesn't modify any of that state while their call is being executed in some sort of parallel context. Um, so we have a way of making that contract through the type system as well using const. So we just make this a const member function. And so now our detection needs to be basically a function with a particular name on any class. And there's one of them, but it could have any signature. So that's a bit of a different problem. And it's pretty difficult. And I had some trouble with it. But I went on the CPP Lang Slack. And uh, Nicole Mazuka, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, uh, sent me this code, which is basically a way of detecting if something is a member function, um, regardless of what the signature is. And since we only care about a const version of it, since we want to execute it in a parallel context, we don't need the additional overloads, but they're easy to make if you need them. Um, and then we have our you know, bool shorthand version of it. Um, so this lets us detect if something is a member function. Uh, then if we want to detect specifically our process member function, uh, we get code like this. And so we use that is member function with the uh, name of our function that we want on t. And if it exists, we get a true value back. And if it doesn't exist, then we get a false value back. Um, so now we're able to detect any signature with a particular name, uh, as long as there's no overloads. This doesn't handle that. But um, again, that's something that we could do potentially in the future with reflection, where we're able to iterate over the members. But today, we can only support one at a time. And then if you wanted to take this and sort of slim it back down into the C style version, where there's no state, it's even easier to do. Um, so with this, we can detect if there's that process mem method there and use it. Um, so we're able to write code that looks like this. And we have tons of opportunities to optimize it. And we can make our contracts with the user of our code through the type system. Uh, so there's a lot less overhead and boilerplate. And we still have all of the same expressiveness and performance that we would want. Um, so the big takeaway here is I think just think about how your systems are architected and how your APIs for them are architected and what your potential performance issues could be and how you can change your interface to give you more opportunities to solve those problems. Uh, so thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, I'm happy to take them. And if you're watching the recording, feel free to email them to me. So any questions? No? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, has anybody looked at like using concepts instead of inheritance? Uh, using yeah, concepts concept instead of inheritance. So the, the question is, has anyone looked at using concepts and type erasure instead of inheritance? Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of people out there. And most of the game code bases live in sort of isolated environments where we don't have a lot of insight into them. Um, even the stuff for like Overwatch, we're only able to know because they presented it in a talk. There's no like documentation or download available where you can get that code. Um, so. I don't know of anyone that's done it, but if it's something you're interested in, you could always do it. Yeah. Give a talk on it next year. <laughs> All right, no other questions? So. Uh, uh, quick question regarding like array of structs versus structs of arrays. Um, let's say you're dealing with a system where uh, it's not laid out in a data-oriented design way, but you're looking to kind of design a next-gen <coughs> uh, system that would kind of lend itself to that. Okay. Do you know of any automatic pooling uh, that could be done to transform the data? Okay, so the question is if you have uh, the perspective of structure of arrays versus arrays of structures, if there's any sort of tooling that can automatically convert from one to the other. Um, I don't recall the name of it, but I know someone was working on a sort of helper type that would uh, provide a sort of class-like interface to, uh, to a structure of arrays backend. So there's stuff out there, but it's not well known yet. And I'm not sure how polished or tested it is yet. Um, but I believe it is possible to do so. And depending on what you want your interface to look like, uh, that could change how easy or difficult it is to make. Yeah. So it sounds like you've been to at least one committee meeting. Yeah. seems like you're obviously interested in the reflection topic. Um, I guess, have 
has the game industry or some group of people in the game industry um, gone to the committee with the interesting things? I mean, you've obviously got a couple of things here where it's like, well, I can already do it detecting mm -hmm. uh, information, you know, that I need with current facilities, but um, I is there sort of a minimal set of reflection that you guys actually need to implement what you need to do? Um, I would say the absolute minimum would be uh, given a particular type, knowing what its data members are, um, so that we can take those and build a GUI front end for them or serialize the type, load it back from memory, that sort of work, um, and do so in a sort of generic context. In the games industry, most of the reflection is runtime, not compile time reflection. Uh, because a lot of game engines will allow users to extend things in a scripting language such as Lua or C Sharp, and that information isn't known at compile time, so they need to be able to extend their reflection data at runtime in order to be able to work with those types. Um, additionally, the games industry has had these sort of urgent problems for quite a while, and so we already have our own solutions to them that are built. Uh, like I said, Lumberyard has their own reflection engine, Unreal has their header tool, and then uh, the approach I'm trying to use is building all of the reflection we need using Clang um, as sort of a build step. So, I mean, I guess it seems to me that, you know, this isn't a new problem, I guess, like adding properties at runtime and so forth. Right. Um, something that has been done in a lot of different contexts. And I, I mean, I guess I wonder if, you know, it's not, I mean, it's a map of values essentially, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, gu I guess, the reflection part of it, it, the runtime reflection part of it is not going to solve that, right? Right. You're, you're still going to have to have some kind of external map of property values if you're going to extend the runtime, right? Yeah, so uh, typically the scripting languages that are used have some sort of metadata available. Uh, Lua has table information, C Sharp has reflection built in. Yeah. And so if you have, oh, uh, sorry, the question was about. Uh, reflection relating to the standard proposal and what the needs of the game industry are. Um, so we're able to sort of take that information and implement the code to map that into our own reflection infrastructure. Um, so whatever we have behind the scenes, we're able to uh, add on at runtime, uh, which is something that might not be possible with a static or compile time reflection approach as I've seen with the proposals. Other questions? No? <laughs> Jason. Just, just your opinion. Do you think that the, the design behind a lot of the game engines is uh, influenced by the compiler not supporting the modern versions of C++? Uh, I think that is a factor for some of them. But uh, if you look at like the Overwatch code, there's nothing there that couldn't have been implemented in C++ 98 besides like the range-based for loop. and there's an, an approach that solves that. It's just not as pretty. That's the difference, right? So I, I don't think necessarily that's what it is, but I think having the modern features definitely makes a lot of these things nicer. It makes them a lot easier to work with and to implement. And so um, the lack of compiler support for some of the platforms, like especially uh, the consoles and handheld platforms, does hold it back somewhat. But I think more so it's that uh, a studio might have a 20-year history, and if they built an engine, they're not going to completely rebuild it as these new patterns come out because they already have it. They've already spent the time optimizing it, and so the value to go back and completely rewrite it isn't as high. And so as long as they're still hitting the performance targets they have, there's less of a need to um, rewrite it in a new way. Oh, and the question was if there are if I think that lack of compiler support for modern standards uh, in the C++ language are holding back the architecture of game engines. All right, thanks everyone.